Galatians chapter 3 verses 25 to 29. Let's read verses 24 and 25. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, Paul says. Now he will go on to tell us what he means by this, verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now what is schoolmaster? Now schoolmaster in the Greek is paedagogos and it doesn't necessarily mean school teacher as we understand it. Schoolmaster is a good word but it meant something quite different back in the days of Paul. It meant a servant or a slave who was part of a Roman household. Now half of the Roman Empire was slaves. Of the 120 million, 60 million were slaves. In the home of the Praetorian Guard or the rich in the Roman Empire, there were slaves that cared for the children. Listen to what it means. A tutor, that is, a young guardian and a guide of boys. He is a boy leader. Among the Greeks and the Romans, the name was applied to trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to the better class. The boys were not allowed so much as to step out of the house without them before arriving at the age of manhood. Now when a child was born into such a home, he was put in the custody of a servant or a slave who actually raised him. He was the one who put clean clothes on him, bathed him, blew his nose when it was necessary and paddled him when he needed it. When the little one grew to a certain age and was to start to go to school, this servant was the one who got him up in the morning, dressed him and took him to school. That is where we got the name of Pythagogos. Paid has to do with the feet. And we get our word pedal from it. Agogos means to lead. It means that he takes the little one by the hand, leads him on to school and turns him over to the school teacher. This servant the slave was not capable of teaching him beyond a certain age, so he took him to school. Now what Paul is saying here is that the law is our pedagogos. The law said, little boy, I can't do any more for you. I now want to take you by the hand and bring you to the cross of Christ. You are lost. You need a savior. The purpose of the law is to bring men to Christ. Not to give them an expanded chest so they can walk around claiming they keep the law. You know, you don't keep the law. All you have to do is examine your own heart to know that. Verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is going to show in the remainder of this chapter and in the first part of chapter 4 some of the benefits that come to us by trusting Christ that we could never receive under law. The law never could give a believer the nature of a son of God. Christ can do that. Only faith in Christ can make us sons of God. In this verse, the word children is from the Greek huios, meaning sons. Only faith in Christ can make us legitimate sons of God. I use the word legitimate for emphasis because the only sons God has are legitimate sons. You are made a true son of God by faith in Christ. And that is all it takes. Not faith plus something equals salvation. But faith plus nothing makes you a son of God. Nothing else can make you a son of God. You are all sons of God. How? It's by faith in Christ Jesus. An individual Israelite under the law in the Old Testament was never a son, only a servant. God called the nation Israel my son in Exodus 4 verse 22. But the individual in that corporate nation was never called a son. He was called a servant of Jehovah. For example, Moses was on very intimate terms with God. Yet God said of him, Moses, my servant, is dead. That was his epitaph 
Also, although David was a man after God's own heart, God calls him David, my servant. My friend, even if you kept the law, which you can never do, your righteousness would still be inferior to the righteousness of God. Sonship requires His righteousness, you see. The New Testament definitely tells us, but as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. John chapter 1 verse 12. We are given the power, the authority, the right to become the sons of God by doing no more nor less than simply trusting Him. A Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, religious to his fingertips, he followed the law meticulously, yet he was not a son of God. Jesus said to him, You must be born again. John chapter 3 verse 7. I want to be dogmatic and very plain. Neither your prayers, your fundamental separation, your gifts, nor your practices will ever make you a son of God. Only faith in Christ can make you a son of God. He once looked at a group of pious rulers and said to them, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father. John 8, 44 Evidently, there were some people in his day who were not sons of God. The only way you can become a son of God is through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27 for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I hope you realize that this verse is not a reference to the ordinance of immersion by water. Being immersed in water is a practice. It is for every believer in obedience to God's command. When Paul is talking about being baptized into Christ, He's talking about being identified with the body of believers. Paul says, For by one Spirit are we all immersed into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. This means that we are identified, we are put in reality and truth into the body of believers, which is the church. For as many of you as have been immersed into Christ or identified into Christ have put on Christ. God sees you in Christ. Therefore, he sees you as perfect. Now, the toga virilis was the Roman garment of the full-grown man, assumed when ceasing to be a child. When an individual accepted the person of Christ, they became sons by adoption. God regards us in him as bearing Christ's name and character rather than our own. The law led us to Christ and when we accepted his lordship, we were given the garment of Christ. We are clothed in his righteousness. We are complete in him. Think back to the prodigal son. He came back recognizing his folly. According to the law, a son could have been stoned for rebelling against his father. Think back, what does the father do? He runs to him, takes him in his arms, shields him from any stone that could be rightfully thrown at him. He then calls on his servants to prepare a feast and gets him to put on a new robe that was to be able to identify himself with his son. By doing so, he publicly announced to all that his son was forgiven and his relationship was restored. He was clothed with a new garment. The old tattered garments of failure to keep the law was set aside, but was now clothed with a robe of grace and compassion. He was not a sinner condemned to die Neither was he employed as a slave, but he was restored as a son. God could have rightfully condemned us to die, but he came down to us, died on a cross, taking our punishment. After having done all that, 
he could have easily demanded us to be his slaves. Because of the great sacrifice, he could have demanded total submission, which would have been good enough for us, since we will be eternally obligated to him. But what does he do? He adopts us as his sons, as heirs to the riches that is in store for us, and we can lay claim to it. I don't know about you, but it's giving me a great sense of freedom. Our relationship with God is not of fear and distance as a slave would have towards his master. Our relationship with God is of love. It's close and it's intimate. Well, how is your relationship with God? Do you realize and do you believe and do you act on that? That you are his child. You are his son. And nothing can change that. Even your own sin in the present cannot change your relationship with God. The moment you accepted the person of Christ, you were adopted as his son. Yes, you have eternal security in Christ because he has adopted you not as a slave, not as an employee, but as a son. Listen to this next statement. This would have been a revolutionary statement at the time. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all all one in Christ Jesus. A Jewish man was known to have started his prayers by saying that he was thankful that he was not a Gentile, a woman or a dog. Now, now the statement that we had just read earlier would have bombed to pieces the dividing wall of prejudice. In this body of believers there is neither Jew nor Greek. In Christ there are no racial lines a Jew prided in his heritage. A Greek does not just mean a person from the geographical area. It also includes one who followed Greek culture. Any man in Christ is my brother. The color, caste or economic status cannot be the cause of division. It is only in Christ Jesus that we are made one. We are one in Christ and we will be together throughout eternity. As a person who follows the written word, remember, above all preferences and references, you need to highly take into consideration whether your prospective mate loves and obeys Christ wholeheartedly. In Christ, you are all one. You can't differentiate between color, caste or economic status. It's only in the person of Christ. I think that's the key for any relationship to exist. There is neither bond nor free. In Christ, a person is on par with his master. In heaven, the servant will be seated next to his earthly master. In our land, we've got to set people who have this mindset. We've got to set people free. How do you treat those who work for you? Do we treat them as fellow kings and priests? Or do we treat them as subhuman individuals? Dear friend, in Christ, they are free. Don't you think we need to be people who can lift and liberate people from these bondages? As I said today, we may not chain people with iron, but by the manner in which we treat them and the way we talk to them, do we not unmindfully bind them? Well, we need to seek ways to help them rise above their position. There is neither male nor female. During the time of this writing, that is the book of Galatians, a woman was never regarded as a decision maker. She was always in subjection and her views were never regarded. They were treated more like children. It was Christ who lifted women to their rightful place. In Christ, women were able to enjoy the liberty. They have equal rights, equal privileges and equal blessings. And they are certainly equally useful. He has made all of us one. One in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? 
I hope that each one of us act on that. Verse 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. How can we be Abraham's descendants? Because of the fact that Abraham was saved by faith and we too are saved by faith. Abraham brought a little animal to sacrifice which looked forward to the coming of the Son of God, the supreme sacrifice. Christ has already come and I can look back in history and say 2,000 years ago, the Son of God came and died on the cross for me, that I might have life and I trust Him. If I am in Christ and you are in Christ, then we belong to Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to the promise. Dear friend, are you living a life that is free? In Christ, you are free. You are His Son. God desires that you live an abundant life. Remember, you are also an heir. God desires that you live a life that is abundant, not a burdensome life. Believe me, dear friend, because of what Christ has done, our life is precious. He offers you His robe of righteousness. Come as you are to Christ, and He will clothe you in righteousness just as that father clothed his son who had run away and made and established and restored the relationship with his son and forgave him. God can forgive you and he can clothe you with righteousness and you are complete. You are free. You are his son and you are his heir. Rejoice and live life to the fullest. Music